Hello, today I'll be showing you how to set up MicroWatt um, as part of the LibreSoc project in order to run simulations starting with a basic hello world example. This will mirror the web page which you'll find on our LibreSoc wiki at uh, libre-soc.org. Just search for MicroWatt and you'll find it. And essentially I'll just be following the instructions here. First thing before we start is please make sure to use Debian Linux, specifically Debian 11. And um, this is because Debian is the system that we use within our team and we won't be providing support for anything else. And um, please have a look at the setup scripts, DevEnv setup, which you'll find on our Git repository. These scripts are used for setting up a CRUD environment, which is a kind of like a virtualized jail, a jail where you move the root directory somewhere else. And that just means we won't be tampering with the host system on the computer that you're running. And uh, the CRUD environments are all standardized to Debian 10, Buster. And the first one we'll start with is uh, make deb CRUD. And we'll call it microwatt. And this script will download all the necessary packages and set up a new CRUD for us. I'll skip it just so it doesn't take so long. Oh, and just to let you know, please make sure to look at these scripts yourself. And um, you might not understand all of them, but it's always good to look at the bash scripts you're going to run beforehand, especially if they need root access. But the main reason why we focus so much on these development scripts is so that everyone has a standardized CRUD environment. And um, it ensures that it will be much easier to debug if there are problems. In past experience, we found that people who don't use these scripts and try to do everything manually uh, take weeks and usually just about succeed or they give up and use the scripts. With the scripts you can do things within days or even minutes when it comes to this. One thing you'll find with this environment is it teaches you a lot of patience, especially when things break. That's why hopefully now that I've sanitized this flow a little bit, it should be a lot more repeatable. Right, now that the script is done, we can proceed on to the next step, which will be to uh, copy over these same scripts to the new crude. It's a little trick we we'll use. And now that it's created, you can actually go in. Now that we've created an environment, sorry, now that, now that we've created a new crude, and uh, got in. We can run some more scripts. This time to get the the um, the various packages. Yeah, this script downloads a bunch of packages, and you don't need to put the time beforehand. That's just for me to time it. Again, I'll skip it like before. It might take a little while. Okay. Now that that's downloaded, we can proceed. With, we can proceed onto the next one. Uh, 
Vera Lita. This shouldn't take any anywhere near as long. But these first few scripts are dependent on your um, internet speed. My one isn't particularly fast. That took a lot less. Now that we've done the first few, let's finish off with the Yosis setup script. And this one will take a while, unless you have a... Actually, no, it doesn't use multiple threads, so it will take a while. So get a nice cup of tea and uh, relax. Well, now that that's done, we can proceed further. Let's continue where we finished. Again, the time it takes for you to set this up it might uh, be drastically reduced depending on your internet connection. Certainly the processor is not the bottleneck in this case. Okay, now that we've downloaded the LibreSock um, local repo of MicroWatt. We need to actually change the branch because we had to make some changes to get it to work on Vera later. The branch is called Vera later Trace. And from this point, we're ready to do the compilation. Need to add some environment variables so it doesn't complain at you. And set the FPGA target to Vera later. Again, this is because the original script was intended for FPGA work. We kind of bolt the Vera later on top of it. Yes, and if your computer is powerful enough which uh, which is my one has six cores and 12 threads you can change the thread number to make this binary compile faster. And uh, what micro verilator is, it will be a binary produced from C++ code. Uh, ah, yes. Before we compile the micro verilator, uh, binary, we still 
we need to compile the hello world code first not because it's actually going to be used at this stage but because it's part of the dependencies for the make file that's just something we haven't dealt with yet uh, because if you actually put the binary of the code you're going to put the, the code you're going to run it will make the very later very big so at the moment that's not being done anyway just run make now I'll compile these and if you'd like to look on the inside look at these binaries what's happening within them you can use the GNU object dump to look at the symbols where they are located in memory such as the headers the startup main code uh, puts put char console in it these are just um, functions which are called by the main C main C code if you want a more detailed breakdown this is the disassembler again shows you the same table as before plus some extra additional information here about the stack and here at the bottom you actually get some interesting things about more detailed breakdown of the addresses what type of symbol it is and the size and this is what the code looks like you just have a pretty little ASCII string of a light bulb some boilerplate code to initialize the console so that you have you are then it just writes a string which is this and then after it's done printing the ASCII bulb it will just have a terminal where you can type in code and it will echo back whatever you type just for sanity checking so now that we have the hello world.hex we can go back and uh, compile very later sorry not compile very later compile micro dash very later this shouldn't take anywhere near as long as the other compilations did and the tutorial wiki page I showed I'm showing here uses an Intel i5 Sandy Bridge processor which I figured would be sufficiently old but pretty much anyone would have it whereas the processor on this machine that I'm using for the tutorial is a Ryzen 3 3600 and it's it's quite a bit faster certainly the extra threads would come in useful if you're going to try something like running Linux which we probably won't be doing for this tutorial so if you haven't heard of Verilator before it's a, it's a type of simulator which converts your design into C++ code how it does that is beyond me uh, but it basically makes a, a binary that you would run on any other uh, such as any other piece of software that would be written in C++ and that makes it a lot faster than most conventional simulators but it's not cycle accurate uh, so it doesn't give you events between clock cycles it only does at at the times of the clock the falling and the rising edge but even that alone is very useful so now that we got that and we compiled the hello world binaries you can have a look at the little help message which shows you how to use this binary 
because if you just run it by itself it does doesn't do anything you actually need to f feed it you need to give it an input file which you will load into ram and in our case will be the hello world file specifically the binary because this is the actual machine code that will be in memory and for now we don't need any other options so you can see it loads it at the starting location here and that's the size and it computes a lot faster than the, the previous example I had Oops, from Libra team. If I can spell. There we go. And as I mentioned here in the tutorial, you can use time to see how long it takes. And also, as I've mentioned here, if you don't see any characters being output, even just the, the upper portions of the light bulb here. That means something is probably wrong with the uh, either the script for generating micro verilator or your code or something else. So just be very careful and follow the instructions. And what you find is there are a few different results. BRAM. You find BRAM dump. which is a breakdown of um, the actual instructions that are being executed. I don't have that much time to go into all of this detail, but this is useful for debugging as well as as, as you start learning the Power ISO instruction set. You'll be able to relate these to the disassembler. Uh, perhaps a good thing would be to do this. Yeah, like that. So if I go into hello world, look at the object dump. VRAM dump. Ah, I apologize. I used the wrong command. The one I want is D, which actually gives you the disassembler. This is the most interesting part. I think I'll need to add that to the wiki. You can see the actual instructions. And let's see whether they correspond. Uh, Ah, yes.
No, this is probably why we need the order to be reversed. 3C, 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. There we go. Yeah. I apologize for the delay. It's because oh, the, the processor is in Little Indian, but there are some other big Indian things, and uh, I don't have time to, to discuss that in detail. But what you see is, oh, where was it? 3C40, there we go. So there you can see the, the start of the disassembly, the console in it happens here. You can see the first instruction, actual uh, opcode, and then there's the add I followed, where is it? Yeah, 00984238, there it is. So this must be data. Anyway, you can spend a lot more time debugging all of this to your heart's content. Uh, another important feature I'll show you. No, I'll leave that. BRAM dump. The other BRAM file is called snapshot. And if you do micro very later, pass the binary again, because you still need to load it into RAM. If you use the dash S option, which is mentioned here, analyzing results after, dash S, and then you specify the time, in this case it's 199.9990, it will actually load it back into the state that it was at when you ended the simulation. So in our case, it was after it printed the ASCII light bulb and I typed some text. So we should be able to type some more text. There we go. So this is really useful if you have a very, very long simulation or maybe you're running out of space on your disk drive so you can stop it. You can remove all the previous snapshots and just keep the later ones. And um, the way it works is you actually also have a corresponding along with the the BRAM snapshot here. You have a corresponding very later save. The BRAM is the snapshot of the memory, the state of the memory while the verilator is the state of the, the verilator model. And you need to have both of these for to properly load your state. And you can see it happens about every two million ticks. Now if we want to do, if we actually want to dump, uh, because at the moment there's also, you'll also find this file, But it's um, it's empty. It doesn't do anything. And that's because we didn't actually enable the dumping option. And there's a good reason for that. You find out very quickly, and I'll show you. Later dash bin dash d is the dump option. You get a little warning here that it says it generates large files, and you'll also find that the simulation takes longer to run. This is because on every tick, on every rising edge. And on every falling edge of the clock, you're constantly you're dumping uh, the trace information to the to a, a file you can then view in a, a viewer, such as GTK Wave, which is very useful for debugging. But I wouldn't recommend using it if you're just wanting to run some code like this at first. Yeah, there's no backspace feature, so you can't correct yourself. 
kind of like a typewriter. Now if we look at the same VCD file, you find that it's very big. That is one gigabytes, gigabytes. That's a very big file. So to give GTK Wave a slightly easier time, take the VCD file, which is kind of a generic file type, convert it into an and convert it into an FST file, which is specific to GTK Wave, and that should be a few orders of magnitude smaller than the the original. And this was just for the Hello World example. As you can imagine, it gets um, quite unwieldy. So GTK Wave and MicroWatt. Ah, I apologize. Now that I've sold that little uh, technical hiccup, please ignore the working directory. This is just a problem with my machine. So you get a GTK wave file, and you can actually compare it against the disassembly and see what's happening. The signals of interest might be, or you can start with the top level. I'm not an expert on this, so probably have to learn a lot of this stuff yourself first. But the most interesting will probably be the instruction. For example, if we zoom around here. There we go. Yeah. Four eight zero 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 one two C. And if we compare that to this. There we go. Zero one two C. Yeah. So that's that's our very start. That's when you go into boot entry. That corresponds to that first instruction right here. Two C zero one zero zero four eight. And if we go down to where boot entry is, there it is. Next instruction address should be this. So if we look for a free C, yep, yeah, there it is. Three C two zero 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 zero. And then you have following addresses after that. Yeah, six zero two one zero 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 zero. 
So you can see how the actual the actual simulated waveform traces would correlate to the disassembly of the binary before you even run it. It's very useful. And you can do this for all sorts of debugging purposes. The trace dumping capability of the code is a lot more there is a lot more complexity there. You can actually set triggers and only dump for a certain number of clock cycles and there's a, a bunch of variability because actually if you're running very big programs like the Linux kernel you might not need the whole dump and actually you wouldn't be able probably wouldn't be able to store the whole dump because just this little example is I wasn't sure if I was 12 gigabytes or 6 gigabytes but it's very big so now that we're done with this I'll finish off a tutorial with the next part now that we've covered the main features of the debugging, I'll give you another example where we run MicroPython. And just before I forget, the VCD file was indeed 12 gigabytes, as you can see. The FST file used by GTK Wave is a lot smaller, 37. So this might be worth keeping. Another thing I haven't mentioned is that the BRAM snapshots are very big as well. They are 256 megabytes each, so keep that in mind. Because our crudes are set up in the slash opt slash opt slash crude directory, which is probably going to be on your main disk drive, so make sure you have plenty of space if you're going to be doing a lot of big simulations. So MicroPython. In this case, I'm not going to show you how to compile the MicroPython binary. That's a, a separate issue. And not that we really need to, because the original the original MicroWatt repo actually comes with the compiled firmware already, so we don't have to do the hassle or work with that. So I'll just show you the changes that you need to make. If we go to Sorry, this is the make file at the root directory of MicroWatt, and it's used to build the MicroWatt da dash verilator binary. And what you find is there is a parameter for the memory size, which we'll need to comment out the 8K one, and instead use this one. I think it's about 384K, something like that. Don't need to change the init file. I don't need to change that because the, the the init file isn't used and this is a parameter for something else. I think I'll also change the thread number just to demonstrate to you how it works. But please, please make sure whatever processor you're running on actually has enough threads to run it. Otherwise, you you quickly reach into um, you quickly have some problems. I'll set it to, I don't know, eight threads. And make clean to clean out all the files for the old binary. You might not actually need to do a whole make clean. I haven't checked that yet. You could also add a J parameter to the to this make instruction as well to do parallel compilation, but that's for you to try out.
now that that's built yeah, it's still not very big Let's see how long it takes We're using eight threads, so it should run a lot faster than the other one did. Ah, there we go. Even when I was testing with three threads, it was a lot snappier. So if you have a multi-core processor, that would be really useful. Uh, that was interesting. Not sure what happened there. Maybe I was typing too fast. Anyway, you'll find some basic features of Python are there. Sadly, however, you'll find that there is no floating point support. Anyhow, that's Python. And you can use a similar type of procedure for actually running the kernel. The SD RAM in it is covered in this section and you can build that separately, like how you built the Hello World example. And uh, as for the kernel, Either you can build it yourself, or I prefer the, the other option, which is just download it from uh, our FTP link, because it already works, it's known, and um, you can try running it. I haven't given it a will. Well, maybe, maybe I should. Yeah, tell you what, I will. So I think I'll raise the thread count a little bit just to make it a bit snappier. I won't show you the whole process because you might even even on this machine it might take a while. When I tried it on the Sandy Bridge system it took two hours to get to I think loading the network stack and that didn't work very well. So we definitely need a bigger memory size, as big as you can get. And that's it. And I do apologize, these instructions I haven't checked because I haven't had time to do them yet. So if you just follow these instructions, these should be nice and easy to do with a pre-downloaded 
a pre-compiled binary downloaded. Okay. Yep, that was easy. Built our SD RAM. You can have a look at it. What it you can have a look at what it does if you want to. It does a bunch of things, and I don't have time to go into them now. DRAM source DRAM object bin DTP image bam. You see how long it takes to boot into uh, You find th this SOC information comes from what's known as a syscon module. And um, I've yet to integrate this from the IRC log. It's an area of memory, a memory mapped peripheral. So you just read that memory location as a bunch of registers. And it has features specific to the HD HDL, like the clock speed, the boot address, the VRAM, etc. SPI and UARTs and so forth. But this process is a lot lengthier, so I'm not going to show you the entirety of it. That's for you to try out and, and play with. And I hope that was useful. Thank you very much.